This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. A member of the Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame and an accomplished novelist, Mike Papantonio, on this edition of Conversations. If you are a successful trial lawyer, chances are you have some pretty good stories to tell. If you're a talented writer, it makes the job a little easier. When you combine both, you have an exciting and intriguing series of novels. And that's what Mike Papantonio has done. His latest, Law and Addiction, exposes the opioid epidemic but at the same time humanizes the victims and perpetrators. Although fiction, the book gives readers insight into how the opioid crisis has created devastation for families and communities throughout the nation. In addition to writing, Mike continues to try some of the most meaningful cases affecting our society, as well as hosting the television show America's Lawyers. We welcome back to Conversations, Mike Papantonio. Thanks for coming back. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Tell me about this book. I mean, it, the, the, the opioid epidemic is a huge topic in this nation right now. The book is very, very timely. Why, why write a fiction book about that? Well, people are busy. You know, they, they, <clears throat> that you, you would think that you get the news that you need about something as awful as the opioid catastrophe from corporate media or mainstream media, but you don't. Uh, and when you're, when you're actually working a case like this, we're trying the key cases throughout America on this project then you, you get the backstory that you really can't tell the backstory in the media. There's a lot of, especially corporate media, mm -hmm. a lot of times uh, corporate media in this particular situation, when I say corporate, I'm talking about MSNBC, CNN, the big, big, mm -hmm. uh, big organizations, they, they're part of the problem, you understand. Right. They failed to tell the story because the advertisers that were paying millions of dollars a year to advertise uh, they, they were afraid they're going to offend them, so they didn't. They didn't tell the story. They didn't go into what what did McKesson do wrong? What did uh, uh, Cardinal or any of the companies? There's many of them. What did they do wrong? Right. And so the the problem that you get into is if you can't tell the backstory, people really don't understand how to solve the problem. You have to understand what is the problem. Mm -hmm. So these books, uh, whether it's Lawn Addiction, uh, Lawn Vengeance, Lawn Disorder, there's a series of them. Mm -hmm. Lawn Slavery is a new book about human trafficking that comes out about the same time next year. They, they go and they follow the backstory. And it's, the backstory is what's, what's, what really happened here. Right. And then they're fictionalized. You know, you add, you add an, a, an, an intrigue here, an intrigue there. And so they walk away from the book and they've learned something that they would have had no way of understanding without a book like this. And at the same time, they're entertained. A novel should, first of all, should entertain. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. people, they have very little time sometimes to even read a nonfiction about something like this. Right. How did the opioid situation get so out of hand? Well, it's, a, it, the, it, it's several things. First of all, the attorney generals throughout the United States failed to do their job. Mm -hmm. uh, the, if I were to point out for you, for example, uh, 10 years ago, the attorney generals had, had all the material they needed to make public how bad it was, to prosecute people who were involved in the process, and to do their job as an attorney general. They failed to do it. Instead, what they did is they settled with them for a little bit of money. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> maybe, I think when it was all over, it was $400 million for the entire nation, which is a drop in the bucket. I mean, these companies made that much money while you and I will do this show. Right. And so, but then the attorney generals then took all the information that they had and they were ordered, the company actually ordered them to destroy the information. So the information was never made public. The attorney generals who did this agreed to do that. It was all kept secret. And so you had another 10 or 11 years where, the, where doctors didn't know, right. uh, for example, how they had been lied to by the industry. This is not a doctor problem. They were, once you understand that it talks about it in this book, how the industry lied to the doctors. They phonied up clinical data presented to doctors and lied about it. Uh, the uh, legislators didn't know because none of it was disclosed. Right. So legislators didn't know how to react and how to say we need to change the laws and go after these folks. 
um, the media, you know, they weren't going to do anything anyway, but they didn't even have any information out there because it was it was destroyed. So it was, it's complicated, but it all goes down to basically people not doing their job, bureaucrats not doing their job, the attorney generals not doing their job. The Department of Justice did horribly bad here uh, under two presidents, not just one president, but two presidents. And so, you know, we we want to and the, the, the look, the FDA didn't do their job. Uh, the DEA at one point didn't do their job. And so you have to say this infrastructure that we have in America that is is a good balance to capitalism. Capitalism is a wonderful system. It's probably the, one of the best systems in the world, sure. but it has to work well. And it doesn't work when government or uh, the media when they don't do their job. And that's what happened here with this. We woke up one morning and we had our neighbor, the neighbor's child or, or uh, aunt or uncle or father or brother dying from opioid addiction, not even understanding how it happened. Well, and it's like the character in the book, Jake, I mean, basically is a young lawyer, but it, it strikes a chord with him because of his brother and then ultimately his, his love interest. Expand yes. on how you, you created that scenario. Well, Jake, the way that we filed, I don't, people don't understand this, but we filed the case in, in, in Ohio that started all of the, the opioid national litigation. Mm -hmm. the, that case came to me from a, a young lawyer in West Virginia really talented lawyer, um, he, but he's a young lawyer. He hadn't been practicing law very long. And so he, he had this theory, and the theory was how do the, the attorney generals mess things up so bad? The Department of Justice messed things up so bad. How do we move it away from them and really represent the people who are most affected, which are the counties, mm -hmm. the cities? And what I mean by that, the cities and counties lost billions of dollars they had to pay for extra police. They had to pay for dependency courts where children were taken away from their parents because both of them were addicted. Uh, they had to pay for the infrastructure for rehabilitation. They had to pay for all that stuff and a, a typical city would lose $100, $150 million a year. Mm. So he, he in West Virginia lived near a town where there were 400 people. In that town of 400 people, the industry was selling six million pills a year. Six million, six for million pills people. to 400 people, and it became very evident to him that what the what these companies were doing is they were they were using they were internalizing the illegal use of the drug as part of their business plan. Understand. Mm -hmm. You put six million pills in an area that can't, 400 people can't absorb six million pills. So what happens? These companies understood, well, it goes out to the street. You have, you have pill mills that take place. You have uh, the Oxy Express that came up from Florida all the way up the East Coast and then out West. You have all of these events taking place. But in order for that to happen, you had to have a glut of pills that were put on the street. And that's what these companies understood. They knew they knew they were selling a thousand times more pills all over the country than what was needed. Why did they target places like West Virginia and other Rust Belt areas? Yeah, what, what is evident is they would go to areas of despair. You know, when you, you can look at an area where you have big job loss, and maybe the coal mines of West Virginia, coal mines of Kentucky, and. Uh, or the cities of Pittsburgh where the steel industry is closing down. So you go to places like that where there's despair. When you have despair, Jeff, you have increased medical care. You, if you go to areas of despair, you're going to find more hospitals, you're going to find more pharmacies. So they would, they would pick out that place where they had the best chance of selling a lot of drugs. And we want, see, we want to look at them differently. We want to say, oh, golly, these guys, they don't look like you know, they don't look like anything that they set out to do. They're, you know, they went to MBA, they went, MBAs from Harvard, Yale, Princeton. Right. They, surely they can't make decisions like this because they don't look like they would have that type of mind, but they do. And so they, they understood that, first of all, we have to figure out where we're we going to sell the most pills. And that, they set out to do that. You know, one of the things that kind of the, the book alluded to is some of the people who were getting hooked on this and becoming addicts were not what you would typically think of as a drug addict. Mm. I, I mean, mm. they were the kid who was a high school football player, right? It's a, it's a real unfortunate thing. Um, we know that when you talk to the public and you say, when we do what we call jury focus groups, 
they have an image that this that it's it is a denial image and the denial the denial is this this can't happen to me it wouldn't be my child that would do this but the typical kind of case for the opioid addict was where they were maybe uh, they played football they injured their shoulder or they injured their knee and a doctor unknowingly in those early days unknowingly <clears throat> gives them 90 90 oxycon okay and they take out 90 oxycon and it's a physiological change that takes place in that child or the mother or wherever it may be uh, it's 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 things like having teeth pulled wisdom mm -hmm. teeth pulled it's it's things like happen to us every day right. and doctors were giving them these pills because because the industry had phonied up literature that told the doctor that our narcotic is different that's all it is is narcotic o opium has been around for thousands of years there's no difference in this opium and any other opium except this is worse because what it does is it feeds your system a little bit at a time and your system becomes dependent on that opium. What ends up happening, it's so bad that the addict, this, it's not, you're not talking about an addict like you would find a heroin addict. Mm -hmm. they, they, they often move to heroin. Mm -hmm. They move to fentanyl, they move to heroin, they move to terrible stuff, but they start off with oxy. They start off with the with these narcotics of that, that are sold, you know, given to them, and the doctor says, "Yeah, he can take 90 of these." Mm -hmm. Well, the doctor in the early days, you look at the you look at the the documents. There's no way they could have known because the, the they were being told, "Don't worry about it, doc. You can give it to him." And the companies tried to foster that. The companies understood we've got to have the doctor continuing to believe that this is not addictive. So you can't throw these people that are, that are overdosing every day. Most of them don't fall into anything that you would imagine is a typical addict. Mm -hmm. These are people that, you know, mothers and fathers and totally normal lives that are turned upside down over, uh, you know, 25 pills. Mm -hmm. it, only takes, it only takes a week and a half for your body to start saying, I kind of like this. It's so bad, Jeff that it takes two years after you stop taking these narcotics. Mm -hmm. It takes two years for the dopamine level in your brain to ever get close to normal. So it's not like, well, we'll send you to Betty Ford for a month and you're gonna be okay. It's meaningless. It's the, re re the repetitive process is, is one of the worst aspects of this. They send their child to a, you know, a rehab center for a month Surely he's going to be, he or she's going to be okay. Well, no, they're not going to be okay because their dopamine level in their brain is telling him, I'm not okay. And, and, and that process continues. And the withdrawals for, from these Oxycontin is just like heroin withdrawal. Those withdrawal symptoms can start as early as three weeks. Wow. And the folks who were distributing these or making them, they, at some point, you're saying, knew the scientific research was, this Phony is bad stuff. Well, they knew and, it was and they, and they knew it was phony. So you're saying they knew it was phony. They knew it was phonied up. Yes, they and just turned their head the other way. Well, they didn't turn their head the other way. They knew it was phonied up, and they took advantage of that. Wow. They 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 tried to prosper from that, and they took they 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 this phonied up information created addicts all over the country, and they took the external they they took the diversion the criminal diversion of the of the drug. And built it into their business plan. I mean, there's 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 documents, government documents that showed. A CDC did a great one where it, it's it's called the the, the death table, and it, it, it's a death map, and it's a map of the United States which shows you step by step how this area became hooked, how this area became hooked. Very specific stuff, and they had access to all this. They were doing their own, and they were following it themselves. And uh, again, until you see, until, <laughs> and when those attorney generals didn't do their job, when the Department of Justice didn't handle these people the same way they'd handle anybody else who's doing awful things, it, it just got worse. Is this anything like tobacco? Your firm was big time involved in the tobacco settlements over the years. Anything similar? Yeah, well, no, it's similar in the sense that the difference is Tobacco wasn't as bad because they would at least live 30 years before they died from cancer or from heart disease. Here, the, the, it's something like two, two and a half years 
is what is what happens after they become addicted and fall into the worst trap. L let me just tell you, when, when, when they can't get oxy, they get heroin. And black tar heroin's coming in from, uh, the, look, the heroin industry, Jeff, would follow the oxy industry. The oxy industry would go into a place like West Virginia, mm -hmm. okay? They would figure out that pills have now been sold for $80 a pill. The black heroin industry from Mexico would come in and say, well, we can beat that. We can give you the same kind of fix for $30 or $20, whatever it may be. And so they said, well, I'm addicted. This will solve my addiction problem. Let me go to heroin. The industry knew all this, and that's what's so phenomenal about this case. They knew all of it, and it's hard for the American public to accept that. Mm -hmm. People are going to be watching this show saying, oh, my God, you know, this can't be true. It is true. It is true. This book, most of the book is true, you know, except the fictionalized characters sure. and the way that the case. But, but all of the parts of it are true, mm -hmm. exactly how, the, how it all started, exactly who's responsible. But... You can't take the time to learn all of that, and you can't even find it most of the time in the media. This, I mean, understand, this is a situation where you're in court every day. Mm -hmm. You come home and you say, okay, this is what happened in court. Let me do a scene from that. Oh, wow. This is a deposition that took place. Let me get that scene in my head, and let me put it in the book. As you were doing the depositions, as you, as you were doing discovery and, and, and doing the things you do to, to get ready for trial, what surprised you most? What was like, holy smokes, I can't believe this? The indifference. I was, I was, I, I, look, I've been doing complicated uh, products cases, <clears throat> pharmaceutical, environmental, huge, some of the best, biggest environmental cases in America. I have seen bad conduct, but this tops it. I, we handled tobacco. Mm -hmm. I've seen bad conduct, right? but I've never seen this. Wow, frightening. Speaking of environmental cases, I understand there's a movie that's coming out, and I think it's called Dark Waters that you... Yeah, were, Dark were, Waters comes out month? this month, November. In November of 2019? Dar yeah, Dark yeah. Waters is about a case that, that I tried up in the Ohio River Valley. Um, it's, uh, it's got Mark Ruffalo, uh, Hathaway, uh, Anne Hathaway, Anne Hathaway uh -huh. Tim Robbins. It's a great cast. And what they do is they, they capture, I think is the most important part of the story. And the most important part of the story was the young lawyer who had the courage to build the case. All I did was try the cases for him. Okay. We tried a series of cases in Ohio, but before I even got involved as the trial lawyer, uh, he had worked up the most phenomenal case against DuPont that you've ever seen. And he just did it. He, he was almost fired from his law firm. He was, the, the, the things he had to overcome were unbelievable. But he cared so much about the people that he grew up with in that Ohio River Valley that he just held on to it and worked it for 11 or 12 years before it even came to me. So the case really isn't about me. The case is about the lawyer who brought it to me and what he had to go through. All I did was try the cases for him and, and got the project settled. For, for those people in the Ohio River Valley. I know another thing that you are working on both on a professional level and you're also, as far as your legal practice is concerned, and you're also working on it from a book standpoint too, is the human trafficking. The, yeah, uh, there's a book coming out, uh, as I say, about this time next year and it, maybe a little earlier than that. But it's called, uh, it's called Lawn Slavery. And we were asked to be involved in trying some of the first um, human trafficking cases around the country. And people don't understand how, that, how is that. Well, what we're finding with human trafficking is none of it really happens without big money and big corporate involvement. You can go to an airport right now, say you go to Atlanta, and you will hear them saying, we're against human trafficking. If you see it, report it. That all started once we started going after the people who were kind of responsible. What was happening throughout the country is you had corporations, whether it's hotel corporations, whether it's airline industry, whatever it is, they, they knew exactly what was going on. We, there's one case with the trucking industry. Um, you have, uh, uh, from California to, um, to, to the East Coast, you would have uh, girls from Mexico and the Sudan and people right here from the United States that are trafficked, truck stop to truck stop. 
and you would have these massive truck stops that, you know, come and get a shower, come and have food, spend the night, and the truck stops, the truck would go from truck stop to truck stop with these girls that were being trafficked all the way across the country for prostitution. They didn't start out as prostitutes, they're trafficked. Right, big right, difference, right, big right, difference. Right. They don't do this because they want to. Right. And so uh, along the way, there would be codes that they would use to say this truck is pulling in at this place. And it's just a nefarious, ugly, ugly story. It's, it's even a hard book to write. Yeah. I've got a guy that's uh, actually, it's the first book where I've written the book with somebody. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, just a very knowledgeable on this uh, process. And uh, so we're working really hard on it. It's a, um, but it's a great fiction, it's a fiction story. High, high. <laughs> High adventure, but it's there again. It's true. It, it's wow. it's it happens all the time. That is we're that. we're right here in Pensacola, one of the worst areas for trafficking because of the location. It's on I-10. It's part of that corridor. Mm, that's scary. Are, are, is any progress being made to to for it to be toned yeah. down? Yeah, we. My prediction is we're going to make real progress on this project. Yeah. Very good. Talk a little bit about when you develop these characters, because the, the, the characters all have a great deal of depth and kind of personality. What, what, what are you thinking when you, when you want to build one of these characters? Yeah, the, the advantage I have in building the characters, I always call them composites. Uh, there's, a, there's a character in there I, I, I think about, his, I call him Jazz Hands. He's a, uh, he's a, he's a lawyer who is always you know, talking with his hands. And, he, you know, do, judge, there's this, 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 this. I think it's in this book. Might, might be in the one I'm working on now. I, I, they, they roll together. <laughs> no, but I, I think, this no, one. Jazz yeah. Hands is in. Uh, but, okay, so you pick that character up. You're in court with these, this really uptight defense corporate lawyer. And he's in front of a judge. And, you know, he's, it's an affectation of sorts. And you go, my God. Who taught him to do that? It's right. terrible. Yeah. And so you borrow from that character and you borrow from another character and you put this composite together, yeah. whether it's a character you like or it's a character you don't like. All of them are composites, okay. Okay. you know. And so um, so the, the, it's fun. I yeah. mean, it's fun to create a character. Well, you live in such a pressure cooker doing what you do as a trial lawyer. Is this, a, is this relaxation for it you is. or is it work? No, it's relaxation. Yeah. Sometimes, like, uh, you know, sometimes it can be work. I'm trying to finish law and slavery right now, and it feels like work. Right. But then, uh, you know, I realize it's so much fun. Yeah. I've, you know, law and slavery has a great character out of Herbert Field, uh, He's called a PJ, a pararescue man. And it was so fun to create this character that comes in to help these girls. And so, you know, you, you, you enjoy doing it. I look forward to saying, okay, here's this. And then I trade off. The writer that uh, uh, Alan Russell is working on with me on this will trade off. <laughs> He'll say, let's do this, and I'll say, let's do this. <laughs> and and you, the synthesis comes out with uh, really, really great characters. So I'm curious, are, are the, some of the characters, I know Deke will continue to be in, in yeah. but how about something like Jake, for example, and Anna? Jake, they yeah, continue yeah on? Jake is back in Law and Slavery. Okay. okay. Jake Jake, uh, is, Jake was a lawyer who lost his license in law and addiction yeah, yeah. because he made public the documents that the attorney generals had, de had agreed to destroy. And he got access to those documents, made them public, and he defied a judge's order. <laughs> and, and, and he lost his license and then came back to work with Deke here in Pensacola. As, a, as, as an investigator. Okay. He's a great character. He's, he's, he, life is good for Jake right now. Let me put it like that. <laughs> are you constantly adding, well, you, you mentioned the, the pararescue guy, but are you constantly adding new characters or you just occasionally? Put no, I, I, I had new characters all the time, Jeff. Okay. Uh, okay. The last one uh, was, a, um, the last one is called, um, uh, well, there's, there's, there's two books before this. And I, I created this character named Gina Romano. Who is uh, who? Law and Vengeance. She's the lead lawyer in Law and Vengeance, and she's a composite, but she's such she's damaged goods, absolutely damaged goods in real life. Yeah. I mean, in her day to day life, but in a courtroom, she, she's extraordinary. <laughs> so it's fun to take those kinds of things and in in all every book create a new character and then recycle them. She's uh, Gina Romano, for example, is also back in Law and Slavery. Now, when you're out working with other attorneys or trying cases, do you ever see somebody and, and go, 
that's a personality oh, yeah. Yeah. that I'm going to have. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it, some of these, when, a trial law, you understand, people don't recognize this, but there are so few trial lawyers in this country that operate in complex cases, um, the, the tobacco or big environmental cases or pharmaceutical cases or big, big uh, corporate conduct cases. Maybe in the in the entire nation, I can name 40, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's what 700,000 lawyers. Mm -hmm. So it's such a specialty that you're always around, kind of right next to that composite that makes up a trial lawyer. Used to be in the old days, there was a trial lawyers. Were, it was a different breed. Uh, you know, they were the fast talking, hard drinking, womanizer. They, they were an awful, an awful composite. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, trial lawyers that operate at this level, they're much different, mm -hmm. much different. You know, family matters to them. Uh, things that matter to everybody, are, they're, they're just part of the community. They're, they're well-centered. And those are the people who, in this business, if, if you go down and I were to go through all 40 that I could name, they would all have that in common. Mm -hmm. So it's a big difference. There's been a big change in what you would call the trial lawyer of, say, 20 or 30 years ago in the trial lawyer that exists today because the level of sophistication yeah. to do these things, it just takes a lot more. Got about one minute left. What's up next for Mike Papantonio? Continuing to try cases? Yeah, well, I, I always try. Yeah, I'll never stop trying cases. I have a daughter who will be trying cases with me awesome. in about another year and a half. Awesome. And she, she'll be graduating from Stetson soon and come to work with me. And so that's exciting. That's one reason I stay in the business. Good deal. And you're going to continue to write novels? Oh, yeah. 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 You going to ever write anything nonfiction, do you think? I mean, I know you've written some legal stuff. I did. Stuff I wrote some motiv motivational books for lawyers in the early days, one called In Search of Atticus Finch, mm -hmm. another one called Resurrecting Aesop and one called Clarence Darrow, The Journeyman. But I, I'd rather write these fiction. It's a lot more fun, huh? Yeah. It's a lot more fun. Mike Papantonio, trial lawyer in the Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame, uh, also starting to make quite a name for himself as a novelist. His latest, Law and Addiction, I'm assuming available on Amazon and yeah, all the usual yeah, places. Yeah. It's a great read. I would highly encourage it. By the way, you can see our original interview with Mike and many more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations and also on YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon.